when you think about a power panel, you are looking at it right here. I have the, uh, the ability to look ahead and get a handle on who these ladies are. And I just kept being, wow, wow, uh, wow. And every time we add and every time we present at this, uh, at this conference, we continue to get this quality. And I'm so glad all of you are here. We'll have a very short time with which to get to know them. So if you have a pen and paper out, we're going to try and get their emails. And they'll rattle them off at the end because we really won't have too much time for questions. On this panel, we have innovators groundbreakers, board members, government positions. We have new producers. We have new products. We have a ninth generation producer here. We have moms, we have wives, we have sisters. Illinois, Iowa, Nebraska, and California. There's a lot on the stage. Again, what we don't have is time, so we're gonna get rolling. And I wanna give a spotlight introduction to each of them, and then I'm gonna ask them to do a two or three minute elevator, elevator speech that kind of tells who you are and what your main focus is kind of on a day-to-day -day basis um, for most days, your primary focus. We'll see if you guys can guess who you are with this. This panelist is a ninth generation producer. She and her sister were always su supported to be on and run the farm. She's the president of the Illinois Soybean Growers, and she's on the United Soybean Board. Lynn, will you please do a full introduction of yourself? Sure, thank you. Um, as Tracy was saying, my name is Lynn Rorschheim, and I'm a ninth generation farmer in Fairmount, Illinois. Very lucky to be able to have been in a family where my sister and I were not treated any differently because we were girls and didn't have a brother to follow in our father and grandfather's footsteps. So, but um, besides the farm, we also have a custom application business. We sell seed, chemical, and fertilizer. And then as well, um, we've been in Fairmount for over 100 years. And then parts of the, the family farm that we farm on my mom's side, we've been able to farm it for about 150 to 160 years. And then, as I mentioned, I actually just recently turned off the Illinois Soybean Association. Um, I was there six years. The last two years, I was the chairman there. A great opportunity with that, and then also I'm currently a member on the United Soybean Board where I'm one of four farmers from Illinois that represents soybean growers there on that board. So now you'll have some free time. I don't know about that, <laughs> but... Uh. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks. This panelist has had the ear of the president regarding matters of trade, has thankfully returned to her roots here in Nebraska as the Assistant Director of Ag, and is most re recently affectionately known as the Hemp Lady. Amelia, will you please introduce yourself? That last one's new to me, but it's got a nice ring to it, I guess. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Amelia Briney. I'm the deputy director here in Nebraska for the Nebraska Department of Agriculture. Uh, and as Tracy said, I'm born and raised in Arapahoe, Nebraska, sixth generation. My dad still operates our diversified uh, farm operation there, and my mom is the, the guidance counselor at Arapahoe High School. But after graduation at the university, I spent five and a half years in various positions in Washington, D.C., most recently as the Director for Intergovernmental Affairs and Public Engagement uh, before coming back home uh, to, to Nebraska. And it's been a year anniversary at the department, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be back in this capacity. I think everybody who works in government should have a parent that's a counselor. It might be helpful. <laughs> She's very good at what she does. <laughs> When we talk about groundbreaking, there's many definitions. And this panelist took it literally, breaking out 50 acres into a vineyard. And she also works with her fifth generation family farm. Tara, tell us about you, please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Tara. Like she said, I'm a fifth generation farmer in California. But sometimes I also call myself a first generation farmer because I planted a vineyard last year. And my family background is corn, so it's quite a change. Um, I also, it's just me and my sister, we were encouraged to do anything we wanted and I went off kind of thinking I wanted to be a teacher, followed the path to be a nanny. I got a two week vacation from my job, happened to be in the middle of corn harvest, so I decided to go help my dad and that was kind of the end of that. I decided that's what I wanted to do forever and I moved home to the farm and long story to how I got to a vineyard, but I got it now. <laughs> Once you know Tara, you realize that there's a lot of things that are magnetic about her, and I think it comes from her farmly, family farm. <laughs> In basketball, you would call this panelist a power guard, a power forward, 
but I'd vote her for any rebounding title as well. <laughs> she was selling crop insurance and selling seed corn before it was cool to be in fe a female in ag. And now she runs the Iowa Corn Growers Association with that same intensity and passion. Jolene, please tell us about you. Well, um, so Jolene Reeson, I'm from Northwest Iowa, Ida Grove. Um, I don't know how many generations I've been there, but you can see a few wrinkles, so I have <laughs> uh, ages on my side. Um, I guess I'm in a little different boat than everybody here. Um, my husband and I farmed for 32 years. I just lost him a year ago to cancer. So it's a new norm for me out there on the farm. I have two boys that farm with us. Um, I am one of the only women that sits on the Iowa Corn Growers Board, which doesn't bother me a bit. I, I've been in egg sales ever since I got out of college. I was always used to being in a man's field, and, and uh, I take no guff. Sorry. <laughs> you know, and, and as, and as a, a farm wife um, and as a farmer, because that's what I consider myself now, and I hope you guys do too, you know, that we are, we are a, um, a special breed out here that I, I call as tough as nails. So. Amen to that. And if any of you saw her take the stage, you'll see that she doesn't take much from anyone with a barrel roll to get up here without steps. Pretty impressive. It's kind of now you kind of know who the last one is, so there's no more guessing. A sixth generation producer, this panelist is on the Iowa Beef Industry Council and gives special attention to being a steward of their land and resources. She travels gro globally to promote beef and pork. So, uh, helping numerous producers continue their success and their legacies. Jenny, tell us about you, please. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jenny. Um, my husband, who's actually here with me today, is kind of hiding over there in the corner. Uh, <laughs> and our four children, we have a diversified uh, cow, crop, cow, calf, and crop operation um, on the very far eastern side of Iowa. So it's about seven miles in from the Mississippi. Um, our main endeavor probably is our bread heifer development program. And we have corn, soybeans, and hay. Most of our corn is put back and fed to the cattle uh, in either the form of high moisture corn, uh, earlage, or silage. Uh, I am on the Cattlemen's Beef Board, the National Board, uh, and am happy to be here with all of these women and very honored, so um, thank you. They're not messing around when I say they're involved in ag. If you were at this morning's session, Mr. Moneyball mentioned how we have typically dismissed things that don't pass the eye test. And I think many female in ag don't pass that initial eye test. And these are just a few of the women who have, are reshaping that for us and giving a whole new look to agriculture. So special thanks to all of you and to all of you that are here making the same changes. So the first question we're gonna start with, there's no limit to this except time. <laughs> and I'm gonna start with Lynn for the first one. What experience or training should every female in ag pursue? I think definitely you need to get out there in your community and just get yourself out there, get involved in 4-H and FFA, and then find yourself a mentor along the way that you can kind of piggyback on and kind of you know, see what they're doing and kind of learn the ropes on a few things as you go through. And I kind of did that myself, but with my family, it was a little bit different with We've always been a fairly large farming operation, and then my dad and a friend of his started the seed and chemical business as well together. So I always grew up dealing with several different individuals and different farmers, and so I learned pretty early on not to take too much gruff from people. And you know, certain times of the year we're all a little grumpier than others. So, um, but just basically get yourself out there and just you know let people understand you and see how you are and that you really have an interest and a passion and. Eventually, you know, they'll come around, hopefully. You know, you can't win everybody over, but eventually people will come around. Super. So I, she mentioned 4-H. Hopefully many of you have participated in that, and mentors are, are vital, and, and we'll probably touch on those later. The next person I'd like to pose this to is Amelia. While she grew up on a farm, she's in a little different environment in ag. She's not necessarily out there every day under the sun dealing with folks with um, pliers on their belts every day. And so what type of experience would you recommend that females in ag pursue? I wish I was more often, to be honest with you. Um, I, I'm, we had a conference call in, in preparation for this panel, and I'm hearing 
what all these women next to me get to do each and every day, and I'm thinking, God, I got to get out of the office. Um, <laughs> but I, I was much like Lynn. I was in, involved in 4-H and, and uh, FFA when I was in middle school, high school, and all that. And when I was in FFA, one of the projects that I did was job interview. I was very introverted. Um, you wouldn't know it now because once you get me going, you can't stop me when it comes to talking. But uh, ended up going to my districts and winning and making it to state and having that sort of ability to learn how to talk and converse with people. As Lynn says, you're never going to win everyone, so that's okay. But at the same time, you have to be able to get the conversation started and you have to be able to communicate your view, your viewpoint, whatever that may be. And so I would say uh, speech. I was also on the speech team and uh, doing uh, certain activities like job interviews, just that professional development. It's useful in agriculture and in any industry for that matter. Absolutely, and if you wanna see how it worked out for her, she did communication and different things. Um, she can totally control a room of those farmers and their jokes and everything while talking about hemp. And it was very impressive when I watched her do that. She just commanded the presence there. Um, Jenny, you've got your young family young and still growing and developing. What are you making sure they participate in or was important for you? Well, we have, um, we have four children and so we have three boys and a, and a daughter and all our three boys are, uh, two of them are through college. One has come back uh, and is farming with us right now and one is a junior uh, at Iowa State. And so then our daughter is a senior. Uh, and the biggest thing um, was 4-H. It was always uh, as far as setting priorities and being involved. Uh, and I, I think one of the things um, as women uh, and mothers, it's good for your children to see you involved. Uh, and sometimes it's hard uh, when they're little. I didn't do a whole lot of uh, any national boards or whatever. I, I stayed at home and that was my choice. Uh, and I think that was important, but as the kids got older, uh, I was able to do a little bit more and a little bit more. And I think that uh, as they grew up, they see, you know, it's okay. That's, it's important for mom to go and do some of that. that. And so I think um, for the kids to be involved in 4-H speech, um, you know, the biggest thing, we always used to make them do 4-H presentations, and they hated it. But I don't know how many of them have come back to me and said, Mom, that was the best thing because I learned how to speak in front of people. I'm not afraid to get up and give a presentation. And even with their jobs today, um, it's helped immensely. Did I answer that okay? Fantastic. <laughs> it's kind of funny if we were all bankers up here, one of them might have said, learn how to golf. <laughs> oh, I see that coming out. But I, what, I thought maybe we saw speech. I thought we might have debate with some of our battles between uh, the different commodity groups and different things sometimes. Um, but that was one I had there. <laughs> Switching gears a little bit. Jolene, let's start with you on this one, if you would. What sacrifices have you had to make or that you still anticipate having to make as a female in ag? I wouldn't call them sacrifices. It, it's what I want to do. It's, it's, uh, and it's, not, it's just like, for me, farming is not a job. I love to do it. That is, I had, when, when my husband passed, I had some people ask me what I was going to do, and I'm like, well, what the hell do you think? <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry. My, we were married 32 years. We bought ground. We, we raised a family. I'm thinking, if you think I'm walking away from this now, you don't know me very well. So it kind of, okay, you can tell I can get a little pissy about it. <laughs> and that did make me mad. And, and yet, so as I'm out in, and I've been involved in corn growers a number of years. I was a, a seed corn rep. I was an egg cam rep. And, and I was in... I was in agriculture when agriculture in the 81 wasn't cool. And so I've, I've seen both sides of it. And now I see that the world wants women in ag. And every chance I get, when I get a chance to talk with somebody, a gal in college or high school, and they're like, well, I don't know what I want to do. You need to be in ag because they want you. And you can make a difference. And all you have to do is tell them that you're a farmer and be able to carry on a conversation. And you will go so far. You just, it was amazing. I mean, so when I came out of college, I got moved to Minot, North Dakota. Do you think I ever saw a wheat field in my life? Sunflowers. I was, the first question I asked my district manager when I got up there, I said, do they plow up here? 
like, wow, that was pretty naive. But yet, because I was from Iowa, because I had a farm background, you can talk farming. Now, I know, I know how many women do we have in here that farm, are, are, you know, are part of the farming? You guys have it made. You can talk farming. You can go into any situation, and you will always find conversation. And I, and I encourage you to do that. Because so the reason I got started in Iowa corn was because I wanted my boys to be able to enjoy the lifestyle to which I grew up in, and that was farming. And so the only way that I thought maybe I could help was to get involved in a commodity that everybody grows a lot of here, you know, in the tri-state area, and and help to make a difference, help to to build those build those exports, build the ethanol. If my boys could make money on the farm, they could make their living on the farm. And so that, that is where I come from. And I don't consider that a sacrifice. That's, I guess, a mission for me. Fantastic. I, I love, it's the attitude that will get you far. And we're looking at a great one right there for sure. Tara, handle this one for us, would you? <laughs> Sorry. What sacrifices do you feel you're making or choices that you've been faced with being both a returning to the farm and a, as a new producer? Do I have to follow up that? Yeah, you do. Right. Yeah. The same We're question. On our age like I've given up everything. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. So what sacrifices have I made? What would you anticipate needing to make? Well, I, I, I mean, it's, it's hard to say after her. I mean, I, it's not a sacrifice. It is a lifestyle. I mean, I, I had a job that I loved. And when I came to the farm, it just it is a lifestyle. It didn't feel like, okay, I'm gonna be working the rest of my life. I'm gonna be living this life that I've been wanting. I kinda of didn't know I wanted it. I, I think that's for me that, why it's not a sacrifice. It was almost like a gift I gave to myself, to be honest. Because I, I even though I grew up on the farm, I never thought I was gonna be a farmer. Growing up, just I was a tomboy, I ran around, and for some reason, I never thought about being a farmer. And I went out, and I was a little lost. I kind of jumped between what I wanted to do, what I thought my passion was, and two weeks on the farm. I was just like, what have I been doing this whole time? And moving back was a gift I gave to myself. I didn't really sacrifice anything because it gave me the ability to live the lifestyle I really always wanted, and I kind of just didn't know it, I guess. They obviously are all from bigger towns than I am because it was a sacrifice I haven't had a date in 10 years. <laughs> so I'm not calling that a choice at this point. <laughs> but I would like to say with what, uh, to echo on Jolene and Jenny's, their comments recently, uh, a choice, a lifestyle. Jenny made a very important choice to raise her family. In some ways it's a sacrifice for ag in that she didn't start as early, but she's making up ground now for all of us. And it's the most important thing we can do and I hope that no one ever does see it as a sacrifice to stay at home with your kids or do the accounting and not be in the tractor and so on. Amelia, here comes yours. <laughs> Actually being on or part of the farm isn't possible for everyone. Financials, opportunity, they're not always there, but there's countless opportunities in ag. Can you steer someone towards some different jobs that they could start watching now for either their kids or themselves? Absolutely. Being in a state like Nebraska, ag is what we do. It's our number one industry. One in four of our jobs is tied to agriculture here in the state. But much of what we produce goes elsewhere. And lots of times it goes outside of our borders and outside of the country. And so when I went to DC, I primarily uh, went uh, in, in a communications capacity. I was, I was on the press side is what we call in DC. I was a broadcasting major by, by education. Um, I thought when I graduated I was going to be in a newsroom somewhere and then I ultimately found out I had a face for radio and then that did not work out. <laughs> but um, I, kind of, I kind of went away a little bit from agriculture when I first started in DC and my way back to ag was essentially working for the administration on, on trade policy. And so I, I think what you have to start with doing first is focusing on those, in, those industries that may be at first glance, and again, as we say, something that you know, doesn't pass the eye test, that maybe isn't related to agriculture per se at first when you think about it, but then going that next level deeper and looking at, okay, actually, no, 
this has a, a big tie to agriculture. This has a big, and, it, and I, I like to say to this day, me getting that job in the, in the administration was when I got the question, why do you want to work here? And my answer to that was, this president's been very clear that he's going to be very active on trade policy. And what we do in this building is going to have a direct effect on my family and all of the families in my community and in my state. So I guess what I would tell people is to, to take a look at different industries that are out there and go one level deeper and find that connection to agriculture because trust me, there's nothing in this world that in some way, shape, or form is not ultimately going to be related to food in the end. Very, very true. But we just need to open our eyes and expand. It does not have to be on farm to contribute. Lynn, you've traveled the world and seen. You've got a few other job opportunities perhaps for people to pursue. Definitely, and I've been very fortunate to be able that our operation is large enough that I've been able to serve on both the state and national soybean boards. And I've really been able to see the world and see how things really work and how um, my, even the grain that my own family and I produce, how that potentially has been across the world. And I saw that firsthand in Taiwan about six years ago. And we were in a, a market area talking with this little soy milk grower and he actually grinded his own soybeans that he would purchase from the United States. And it was through a company that we actually sell our soybeans to. And, you know, you have that, the interpreter with you and there's always some kind of translation gap there. And he was carrying on and I'm trying to, you know, follow what they're talking about. And then I heard this certain variety that my family grows. And I was like, whoa, 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 hold on, back, back up here. What are you talking about here? <laughs> and, uh, and the variety that I heard was correct that he looks for, and that actually was a variety that we grow on our own farm and have some pretty great success with. And I was just like, holy cow, this isn't hogwash that I've been <laughs> hearing my whole life, that what I'm growing on my own operation is actually touching people across the world. So that's always really intrigued me, and I always try to tell people when, they're, when I'm mentoring local girls or local youth around in our local area, Look at different government areas if you have any interest of maybe getting into FAS, the Foreign Ag Service, and you can go and um, they'll send you around wherever around the world and you get a little bit of a bigger picture of what's going on. And definitely technology is just absolutely booming anymore. And to think of what the things that we're doing now that we weren't doing 25 years ago is just crazy. And if, if you would have asked me when I was in junior high and high school that I would be doing so many different things through an iPad with our planters and our combines and our spray rigs and our floaters. I would have told you you were crazy, you know, because the John Deere Green Star, that system was just coming up. Case was coming up with their own things. Ravens and Vipers were coming up with their own equipment and that. And like, the, the, the future is just endless is where that's going to go. And I think more and more of us are going to be sitting, and I hate to say it because I love when I get the chance to actually get out in the tractor and actually get to play in the dirt, as I call it. But um, I spend most of my time on the technology end anymore, uh, just trying to make sure that things are flowing, things are going well, and that our employees, which I hate that word, with people like to use that word, we see them more as our family on our farm because they're with us more than they are their own families, unfortunately. But, um, but I just think technology is just where it's going to be in the governmental end of it will play a huge aspect of it, just like you were saying with trade and that. So. I still can't reset my VCR, so this precision thing is kicking my butt. So anybody that wants to study precision, please do and call me. Jenny, what are your kids studying currently? Are they studying ag in college or plan to? They are. Uh, we have the three boys. Our first one graduated in animal science. Uh, the second one was an animal science major as well. Uh, our third son was forestry major and came home uh, at Thanksgiving and said, oh, mom, dad, uh, I'm switching to agribusiness, so that's fine. Um, and then uh, our daughter uh, is planning on uh, majoring in animal science as well. So we've got a lot of scientists in our house, um, and uh, that's all good. I, I think that uh, the world for agriculture, like Amelia said, um, it's large. There's a lot of things out there, and everything is connected with the food that we eat, uh, which means the plants that we grow. And uh, there's a lot of opportunity for men and women. Uh, you, just have to, you just have to find it and you just have to grab onto it. So important. Anything can come back to ag. Just like Amelia was saying, I studied wellness. And I'll be darned if I'm not using those same principles to impro improve the health of my plants that I tried desperately to improve health of people. Plants are much easier to work with. <laughs> 
I want to do a, some hottest trends right now and either shout out or you guys come and I want to make a quick list of what the hottest trends or topics in ag are right now. Hemp. Hemp. <laughs> Nick. Sustainability, thank you. Trade. 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 Um, yeah, I'm gonna, can I put social media to getting that out there? <laughs> Plant-based products, perhaps. <laughs> 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 will help me Swedish. tell it like it I is know, right there. Super. Super. <laughs> we can still shout them out, but you know the fun one that's happening right now, Amelia. Would you? It's a brand new commodity, essentially, and it, it's poised to be a, a difference maker for a lot of different reasons. Can you give us a snapshot of? what it's going to take and what's happening. Oh, we're talking about hemp. Hemp, yeah. Man, why did I bring it up? Yeah, you did. I did. Um, that's, that's a good question, and I think, honestly, I, I say this in every talk that I give. I think it depends on who, who you talk to. So at the department, in addition to being deputy director, I'm also the legislative liaison. And so when the federal government passed the Farm Bill of 2018, of course, it legalized hemp and removed it from the federal controlled substance uh, list and so thereby states now are in the process of putting together their own plans to submit to USDA to to grow hemp. Uh, I think there is a lot of potential. I think there is a lot of possibility with this and I think um, farmers across the nation and certainly in Nebraska are are looking for something especially in this climate to help diversify and help be able to make a difference in the bottom line on their farms. Um, that being said this year in Nebraska, we chose in 2019 to just have sort of a more research-oriented program in which we uh, extended licensing agreements to 10 individuals throughout the state. And we really saw mixed, mixed results there. Uh, we had some folks that were able to bring their crop to fruition and harvest, some folks that unfortunately were not. So I do think there's potential there, but I think at this point, it's going to be a process to get to see that potential. And I do think what we're seeing already, and I hear stories of of states like Kentucky and Montana and some of these other states that were a, bit or, a, a little bit more forward in their process than Nebraska was of having an oversupply now and having that created some market orientation issues. So I think it remains to be seen. The potential is there, but we'll just have to see. Is anyone currently planning, using? Sorry, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go. Thank you. I, I really think you should get with Amelia, possibly a different state or something, but it's great to network with that. I'd like to, when we talked about plant-based, I think it's key because there's a lot of discussion there and a lot of us need to underside both, understand both sides before we talk, similar to milk, soy milk, and all of those. Lynn, do you want to kind of kick off a little bit of how you address that? Yeah, sure. And this is something that we really tackled even on the state soybean association a lot of now about how the alternative protein meat sources or the fake hamburger or now Burger King, you know, you see the impossible burger and all, Whopper and all that coming out. Um, basically, we see that there's a point to all of that, that there's going to be a niche market for that everywhere and that we can all learn to play in the space. Not everybody's gonna like everything and some people are happier with some forms than others. Just like the same thing that as a, as a farmer, some of us are really into growing non-GMO crops or organic or going into traded crops. It's not necessarily because we think that one is better than the other, it just it might work in our area. But as long as there's somebody who sees the benefit in those products and is willing to purchase those products, then there's a viable market for that. And if they continue to be able to work with those alternative protein meat sources to be able to get some of the financing on it different. It might take off a little bit more, but I don't think it'll ever get to the point where it'll totally um, take traditional meat off, off the market or uh, to where their market can't. share will drop right. dramatically. I don't think that'll happen. And Ginny, probably, you're, you're probably dealing with this, I don't know about daily, but it's been on your plate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's up and coming. And I think um, as producers, um, you know, in the cattle industry, uh, you know, it's an opposition. But I, I think the thing that we have to do as cattle producers is, um, you know, we have to, and livestock producers, is ask ourselves, is the livestock 
you know, are we contributing to the good uh, you know, of, of the country and to society? And we say yes. So um, these things probably aren't going away, like she said. So I don't think for one commodity to um, discredit another one is probably where we need to go. I think we need to, as a uh, beef industry or livestock industry, we need to promote our own. And you know, say just that. We have a great story. I think somebody said out in the audience the story of farming and livestock. And really ask ourselves to begin with, why, uh, why are consumers seeking an alternative product to begin with? And so once we find that out, uh, I think we're better able to tackle um, the demand for that and understand uh, you know, why are they seeking that. Is it because they are against animal production completely? Um, or do they have you know, concerns that you know, beef is, is unhealthy? Um, so those are all things that um, you know, producer or consumers need to be, uh, I don't want to say educated, but they need to be knowledgeable of what, what, they're, what they're consuming. Uh, it's perfect. If you, until you know where someone's coming from, you really can't discuss it appropriately. And I think that education and correcting misinformation is one thing we all can be prepared to do. Trade, let's talk ethanol yeah, how for a minute. That? How's that going to work? We're, getting, we're close, right? Yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to get across the finish line. Um, I don't know how many trips... Iowa corn people have made to DC to talk to whoever and now the so when we talk about being involved in agriculture and like I say for me it was trying to make a better life for my boys you know down the road this is a place where you guys can get involved so they just finished a comment period talking about ethanol and the and the small refinery waivers there was an opportunity there that you could get online and 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 about the time it takes for you to, to get on your cell phone and maybe look at a text, that's all the longer it takes for you to respond to your senator or representative and tell them, we need to um, make sure we have a strong ethanol out here. Trump said you know, that he was going to 15 billion gallons. It's like, dude, 15 billion gallons. We need it for our markets. Um, they need to be reallocated back. Um, we're getting mixed signals from uh, the EPA saying probably not going to be that much. And my answer to the EPA is Environmental Protection Agency. So what don't you get about ethanol being good for the environment, making better air for us, to which we've all seen in different you know, major cities where we've started to blend ethanol in there and how it cleans up the air quality? How come you can't embrace this? Ooh, I spoke that. I just, I, sorry. Here we go. But I'm like, you know, this is, we're, we're, we're trying, you know, as farmers, we want to make the world better for our kids. Or we want to leave our ground as good as, if not better, for our families. And that, and by, you know, putting ethanol in this mix, we can do that. Um, so if anybody sat in on the poet talk, he was like, farmers are, can contribute to the, um, take that back, farmers are not contributing to climate change, farmers can help, you know, fix that. And I've said that a lot, you know, for, you talk to any of these ladies up here, and I'm sure a lot of you folks are doing it on your farm. There's cover crops, there's, there's no-till, there's, we're using less nitrogen than we ever did, we're using less, fer, fer, yeah, less fertilizer, less, we're using less everything, and yet we are able to produce more. So to me, that's extremely sustainable. And that's what each of us has to be telling our story, what we're doing good on the farm. And don't let people you know, bash you and say, oh, you farmers, you're polluting my water. Oh, no, I don't like giving you my nitrogen. No, not at all. <laughs> Trust me, that's an expensive input. And I'm going to do everything I possibly can to keep it on my farm. And here's what I'm doing. That's how you, you know. And then you're going to get those people where I call them, I can't fix stupid. <laughs> and I have to have a frozen moment and let it go. Some people, you are never going to change your, their mind. And so just realize that and move on. But those people, I figure, I'm going to come around the back door. Because eventually, you're going to listen to somebody else that you think is you know, 
very knowledgeable, and I'm going to convince that person that my, the way I farm and ethanol and, and the things that farmers do out here is we are, we are part of the answer. We are not part of the problem. That's, so That's how you get to those people. I would just ask everyone to raise their hands. Other than here at this conference, how many of you have either actively told your story or reached out to a commodity group or a senator or a legislator in the past year? Not too bad. We can do a lot better. And when, I, when these guys give their time just to be here, I'm appreciative. When they're giving their time over half to be gone from their farm, half a year, we need to do more to help them. And I'm guilty. If it wasn't here, I probably didn't do anything. And so we all can do more. We don't have to sit on a panel. We don't have to do all those major things, but we can help them that are willing to and have that time. I know we're getting kind of close on the, is there something? How, how do we do something? Uh, the websites that you talked about. I saw um, Tell Sunny is a website for the Secretary of Ag. Get on there and just type something. Do it every day. Sooner or later, it will get through to them. Yeah. And a vote of confidence to your legislator. Talk to your representative. <laughs> She's you giggling. Tweet, you can tweet POTUS anytime you want. <laughs> I have. And, and then I get this, the White House has received your response. I'm like, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> All the, there's, I don't think there's much of anything. We've got several social media um, Giants and leaders. I saw someone and I can't find their face right now. Oh, the, the YouTube panel. They've already I had to go. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> we can do that, even if it's just an email. Yes. And I think it's fantastic if you or someone that you know has a position to send that to a list, ask them to do it. They just haven't thought of it or they got busy with it. Or if um, something really pisses you off out there, get on it. I mean, don't wait for somebody to say, can you please? No, this is your livelihood you're fighting for. I, I, I can't express that enough. This is your livelihood. Do you want it? Do you want to see agriculture continue and do well? Then do something. Quit sitting. Don't be a baby in the corner. You know, don't put baby in the corner. Be a part of the, of the you know, the solution. I just, I... Call to action, girls, ladies, men, do it. And they want to hear from you. They really do. And a lot of I need to. different uh, trips that I've made to D.C. and even in my own state on the local level, they really don't understand what issues and how they affect us until we speak up. We're less than 2% of the whole population, farmers in general, that are actively engaged in farming. Think of that. Like, and numbers is the game that is played in Washington. So if they don't hear anything, they think we're fine. I think we're fine. Happy. So so wrong, aren't they? Amelia? Well, I was just going to say, I think, too, it's important to remember that if you're speaking uh, to the same audience over and over again, and especially particularly the folks that are already on your side, that's, that's not getting you anything. In, in Nebraska, you know, we're very fortunate to have a delegation that all around is very supportive of agriculture. And so when we go to our members and we continue to, to tell them, you know, what's going on and what we need, they're very supportive. They're already there. Now, I think everyone in this room might sit and say that there are other senators that we just may never went over, other congressmen that we may never went over. But at the same time, I think you have to seek out those people that are maybe not on your side already, because if you continue to talk to the people that you've already won over, you're in the same position you were already in. Yeah, we do. Excellent point. Well, I mean, every year we're in, in uh, D.C. two or three times a year just to do strictly lobbying. And, and, when I, and I do not go to corn states. And, and they'll look at me like, so what do you, what does ethanol have to do with me? And I'm like, do you breathe? You know, and they kind of look at me. I'm like, it has to do with the air that we breathe. And everybody breathes the air. So right away, you're making some, you know, we're all in this together. You got to find that common ground. And, and you have to relate to them why this is important to them. You know how important it is to you. It's your livelihood. But you have to you know, figure out a way. And so the commodity groups, um, uh, the, the renewable fuels, people, there, there's a ton of people out there. Just start Googling. And, uh, and you'll find those. And everybody has their talking points as to, you know, things that you can visit with your uh, senator and, and representative about. So please, you know, nobody likes politics. But yet it's a sandbox we have to play in. 
and some people don't play very nice in there, but we still have to figure out because those are the people that set policy, rules, and regulations. So the more effective that we are talking to those people, getting our story across, and you all have stories. You all have your own story from the farm. You know, I grew up here. You know, this is, our, this is how our farming operation has changed. You know, tell it because people want to know. People, you know, farmers are held in extremely high esteem when you get out of, the, you know, basically kind of when you get in, into the coast. People love to talk to farmers. And, it, and it's funny, you know, I can strike up conversations like, you're a farmer. I'm like, yes, yes, I am. <laughs> You know. And key to all that is keep your own personality and individuality. Because I guarantee not many of us can be Jolene. No, you don't want and to. Not many, <laughs> and not many of us can have the composition and the wherewithal to speak to government officials. Like yeah. Lynn and Amelia and Jenny traveling the, traveling the globe. In the back. How do you educate the consumers who aren't interested or who are closed-minded? Same? I can. Jenny, yep. please. Um, I think, first of all, is that you never say, I'm going to educate you. Right. Okay? So I think, um, number one, we're listeners. So if someone doesn't like, uh, you know, a beef product or they're against beef or against agriculture, corn, soybeans, whatever, um, tell me about it. Yeah. Share with me. Yeah. Why? What What has happened in your life that you feel that way? And then... You know, it starts opening up because when someone has the feeling that you have empathy for their situation, then they're like, oh, well, she wants to know. And we, you have to be there, so you have to understand, why do you feel that way? Well, let me tell you about this and see if maybe you see how I feel. But I think number one is we be listeners. We are listeners. We're not out to always be rah, rah, rah. There's a time and a place for that, but there's a time and a place that... We need to listen to why they feel the way that they do so we can help them and change um, their, their mind or help them understand the way that we live and why we get up in the morning and, and do what we do each and every day. And agree to disagree. Right. Um, Jolene, you want to say your catchphrase once again? Because it fits on some of these things. Can't fix stupid. Can't fix stupid. So there are a few things that we do know because we're living it. But just smile to yourself and don't waste your time trying to you can't pull somebody you through. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Sarah. So I bring third graders out to my farm in the fall and split them up into groups. And, and so number one son gets the equipment part of it. And uh, so here, you know, he boosts the third graders up there. And this one little girl, she goes in the cab. She comes running out. She goes, there is a TV and a phone in there. They just got it made. But, but you know, and, and I'm a, so Ida grows 2,500 people. I feel I'm a very rural community. And yet, um, are those kids that, and I had 60 kids come out to the farm, five of them were from farms, were actually living on farms and the rest were all. And not that maybe they didn't have grandparents or aunts or uncles, but yet that, and you're right, that that's, and that is the struggle that we deal with. And that's why your, your message, your, your story is so important because people, people love the farm. I mean, it's, you should see those kids and, and that. So I have, we do a, a scavenger hunt. And so when we get done, I have them at a point kind of far out. And I'm like, all right, you all look really slow. And I just start running. I'm like, <laughs> you're not going to be able to catch me. And man, them kids. And so by the time they head back to town, they're poop. But they have, but I, and then one day, so I have a, a, a tank full of corn. And the kids are like, <laughs> and the kids come to me. It's like, 
can we take some of this? I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> and them kids are stuffing it in their pockets. And when they get on the bus, it's all over the bus. And it's all over in school. And I'm sure it hit a washing machine or two. But I'm like, so I'm sure those parents probably had a conversation with those kids about how their day was. And I, and I enjoy being a part of that, you know, starting that conversation about farming and, you know, and, and, and teaching. And spreading. And spreading. Both seeds and knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we're going to rattle off some emails here in a second. Would each of you, while they're getting that out, would each of you tell us, your number one, number two, if you can rattle it quickly, what your trusted source for ag information is? What do you go to? Or, or maybe I should say who, because Twitter is a little broad, if there is someone. Jenny's looking. She's got it. Uh, we have a DTN machine, and uh, and my second source is my husband. So, uh, a wise woman. Yeah. <laughs> happy woman, happy husband. <laughs> Super. Amelia, look, different aspect of ag. Dad, 100%. Dad, he, he called me on Tuesday with something that he found out Monday that he called someone else on Monday before he called me on Tuesday, and I'm going... I can deal with this for you. Like, yeah. call call me, but my dad, 100%. Um, and then the Wall Street Journal for trade um, on, on a national level, uh, it just it does a good piece on trade. Good. Tara, well, been off on the coast, so yeah. <laughs> some different information out there. Yeah, well, I mean, when it comes to, like, dad, I mean, like, yeah, dad is definitely first, and I have a mentor I go to for the vineyard stuff, but, like, I go to the Farm Bureau a lot for um, information, and the FSA and USDA, those are big resources for me, but, I mean, my first call is dad and, and mentor. <laughs> Super. Lynn. Yeah, so I subscribe to a lot of different periodicals and things like that. But then one of the biggest things besides my own family and that is that there's a peer group of us. There's about, oh, 10 of us that try to meet together every once in a while. And, you know, when we've got enough time, try to get a, a beer or whatever and just kind of think what we're all kind of thinking, what's going on and what we're doing. We're all a little bit outside the box. And if you can get a like a little peer group together to find out what everybody's doing just a little bit, you don't have to copy everybody per, you know, totally. But uh, you know, you kind of learn some different things every once in a while when you sit down and just kind of talk about what you're thinking you're doing. I think that's a, a great point to make. Jolene, do you have a trusted source? It would probably be my dad. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, that he's helped me get through a lot of stuff. So, awesome. yeah. See. But hey, just so you know, my mom never wanted me to go outside. She, wanted me to, she was one of those German ladies that. Well, there, I had four brothers, and I'm the only one farming in my family. And so it was, yeah, oh, she doesn't need to go outside. I'm just dying. I'm like, oh, no. So, yeah. A lot of the interesting that I would say to you is many of the positions that are in the Farm Bureau and the FSA, they are women yeah. that are holding those. So in a roundabout way at those organizations, we are seeking out women. Smart group. A very smart group. It is, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, Trish. It is an interesting point you mentioned there. And as I was growing up, my mom's mom, so my grandma, she was one of my biggest inspirations. My grandma was born in the mid-teens, the 1900s, and she was out in the fields just alongside her brothers and her dad, and she would tell me all the time that I was just an absolute idiot, for lack of another term, of wanting to farm. <laughs> And I'm just like, well, you did it, and you went through a whole lot more crap than I did, you know, and what I'm doing. So, I mean, I used what struggles she went through growing up and having to raise a family, and they had a fairly large family, and still having to be in the tractor with my grandpa or my great-grandparents, and then still having to come in at night and make supper and, you know, take care of my mom and her siblings. So, I mean, I looked for her while she was alive, a lot of strength, and tried to bounce a lot of ideas off of her. So it is out there. It's just we don't always just necessarily, if they're not around or that. But, but in my own situation, my grandma was, I mean, she was the top farmer if, you, you know, if I didn't see my dad every day. So. We spend a lot of time with our female moms or grand. We have, what, is it a fast one? Yay, lead. <laughs> I, 
think every state, most states still have those. And so if your state does, would you mention what it's called? And, and we'll go from there, Jolene. Oh, in Iowa, we have the I lead, which is uh, we select like 20 candidates. Uh, we have quite a few that um, put in for that. And then you know, on the college level, we have the CAPS program, which is um, representative of kids from all the universities in the state. Um, and then we, we teach them leadership. They are brought in. They, they sit in on, so I'm a, a vice chair of our usage and production, which deals with ethanol and, and the farm bill. And, and, uh, and those kids come and sit in on our meetings and learn that way. So the invitation is there. And, and all our, at least at CORN anyway, all our meetings are, are open. Anybody can come and sit in on them. There's not much that isn't. We just got to get people looking and thinking. And I wish we could explore that a little bit farther because it, it's a valuable question. And so maybe all of us could go out and try to get a little article or a shout out in our local papers about that. I think it'd be fantastic. So we'll take that on as our mission from up here. Um, I'm going to have them read off their emails because I don't think we have it on a screenshot. Lynn, would you start us off? Yeah, sure. And unfortunately, mine's kind of a long doozy. Um, so it's my last name, but it's R-O-H-R, S is in Sam, C is in Cat, H. E, I, B as in boy, and then farms at hotmail.com. And then I'm also on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, both on Facebook as a personal page, and then also I operate our farms page as well on there. Super, and it was farms, plural. Yep. Amelia? Uh, sure, I have some business cards too, if anyone wants okay. to find me after, because I have one of those fun German names as well. And so it's, <laughs> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spell it out because I actually have it wrong in the program, which happens all the time, so it's fine. But it's Amelia, A-M-E-L-I-A dot B-R-E-I-N-I-G at Nebraska.gov. And ours is Charlie and Jenny at Peter's Beef Genetics dot com. Peter's Feed. Beef. Be oh, sorry. Peter's, Peter's Beef, beef. Genetics dot com. And we have a business Facebook page and a website as well. And everyone is Googleable. Got to have a better way to find that. Tara. Uh, my email is beaver vineyards, beaver like the animal, at gmail dot com. And I'm pretty active on Instagram and YouTube. So that's probably the best way to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Link. And mine is R, as in recent, seed, S E E D, 2010 at gmail.com. I used to have a Pioneer dealership, and so that's how that went. We got to keep that. I just can't say enough for all of you for coming, being here, listening, being willing to take the information that they've provided and put it into action out there. And way to go, producers. Keep rocking it, and we will hopefully see everyone back here for a panel next year where we continue this rise. Except on the main stage this time. <laughs> the rise in women in ag. Thank you all.